we're going to spend some time talking about those things that you need to know to get through the transplant process. We're going to talk about complications of end-stage liver disease. We're going to go over some transplant terminology. You'll have an opportunity to see our outcomes. And we'll spend a little bit of time talking about post-transplant care. The reason we don't take a lot of time with that is because when you're in the hospital after transplant, that's what they do. They teach you and your loved ones how to take care of you after transplant. There are three main complications of liver disease. The first one is something called ascites. It's an abnormal fluid collection that's usually in your abdomen, but sometimes it can be everywhere. We've had people gain as much as 100 pounds in this kind of fluid accumulation. It's caused by a lack of a certain protein that helps mobilize the fluid so that it goes into your circulating system and is filtered out through your kidneys as urine. The way we manage this complication is really threefold. We use a fluid restriction, which is a liter and a half, that's six eight ounce cups of fluid and only two of those cups should be water and or ice. The second thing we do is we manage your sodium. The fluid that you accumulate doesn't have any sodium in it. Because there's no sodium in that fluid, all the sodium rushes to that fluid and just collects even more fluid. So we recommend a two gram sodium diet. The dietitian has a lot of information about how you can manage that diet. And the last thing we use are diuretics. Diuretics are those water pills, and we use two main water pills. One of them is called furosemide, and the other is called spironolactone. And we use those in tandem, so if we change the dose of one, we will likely change the dose of the other. The downside to the diuretics is that it can be very, very hard on your kidneys, so you may find us stopping your diuretics, and you call your coordinator 10 days or two weeks later and say, I've gained 15 pounds, what do I do now? And so then we start adding back those diuretics so that they're not so hard on your kidneys. The second complication is something called hepatic encephalopathy, or HE. And at its very least, it's an inability to connect the dots. At its very worst, it can result in coma that requires a breathing tube and a ventilator. There's two medications that we use for that. One is called lactulose. Lactulose is a sweet, sticky syrup laxative that you take sometimes two, three, four times a day. You take enough to have at least three loose bowel movements a day. The other drug is called Zyfaxin, and Zyfaxin is a pill, and if you don't have insurance benefits for this pill, it can be extraordinarily expensive, although there are some resources available to you, and you would talk to the social worker about that. The good thing about lactulose is that you can titrate it. That means if you're having too many bowel movements, you can take a little bit less. If you're not having enough, you can increase the, num the number of spoonfuls that you take. The only time that you should be taken to the emergency room for hepatic encephalopathy is if your caregiver cannot arouse you or if you become combative. The third complication is something called varices. Varices are varicose veins that develop usually in your esophagus, but they can develop anywhere, and they can become as big as your thumb. They can tear and they can bleed profusely. It's a life-threatening emergency. You call 911 and you go to the nearest emergency room. One thing that you should be doing with your local gastroenterologist is having an endoscopy where they take a lighted camera down your esophagus to check what stage varices you have, if you have any, and if they need to be treated. We also use a medication usually called Natalol. Other medications that we use are those beta blockers, those drugs that end in OLOL. Again, to remind you, if you are vomiting bright red blood or coffee grounds material or having black or tarry burgundy stools that have a real distinctive copper odor, this is a life-threatening emergency and you call 911 and go to the nearest emergency room. Now we're going to switch gears and start to talk about how do you get a liver offer. Liver offers are based on an allocation system that is has been developed by UNOS, which is United Network for Organ Sharing. And the allocation system is based on something called a MELD score, Model for End-Stage Liver Disease. It's an extremely objective calculation that is based on three lab values. 
your total bilirubin, which is how well your liver gets rid of bile, your creatinine, which is how well your kidneys work, and your INR, which is how well your liver is making blood clotting factors. It's a weighted calculation. The total bilirubin is weighted the least. So big changes in your bilirubin result in smaller changes in your MELD score. The INR, however, is weighted the most heavily, and that means that small changes in your INR result in much bigger changes in your MELD score. Unfortunately, things like hepatic encephalopathy, varices, GI bleeds, poor quality of life are not calculated in the MELD score. It is purely an objective method of determining what your risk of death from liver disease is. If you're interested, Piedmont has an application for both iPhones and Androids that you can calculate your own MELD score. Some more information about the MELD score. The MELD score calculates between 6 and 40, with 6 being normal and 40 being the very worst at the highest risk of death. If you put in a total bilirubin of 1 and a creatinine of 1 and an INR of 1, which are all normal lab values, into your MELD calculator, your MELD score will be 6. If the MELD score is less than 15, in most cases, you're not sick enough for transplant. Remember, the MELD score calculates your risk of death from your liver disease. If your MELD score is less than 15, that usually means your risk of death is greater from the transplant surgery itself rather than your liver disease. Once the score goes over 15, that risk starts to shift. Your lab work schedule, once you're listed, is based on your MELD score. United Network for Orgas Sharing requires periodic updates. If your MELD score is 10 or less, your labs have to be updated once a year with your listing. If your MELD score is 11 to 18, your MELD score has to be updated every three months. If your MELD score is 19 to 24, once a month, and if your MELD score is 25 or greater, it's once a week. And you'll work with your coordinator to make sure your lab work gets done on time. We are currently transplanting at Piedmont with MELD scores between 25 and 30. For most of you, the liver transplant evaluation process will, be will take place in two phases. The first phase consists of attending a class or viewing a video that reviews the entire transplant process. Then you'll also meet with a surgeon, the social worker, and the dietitian that will assess your specific needs and develop a plan for you to move forward with transplant. The second phase of your transplant evaluation consists of one or two days in the, at the hospital getting all of your testing done. If it is a two-day evaluation, you will spend one night in the hospital. The testing consists of lab work, a chest x-ray, EKG, some type of cross-sectional imaging, either a CT or an MRI, bone density scan, and cardiology testing, as well as any other tests or consults that are needed based on your condition. The week after your full evaluation, your case will be formally presented to the selection committee. The members of the selection committee include the surgeons, the hepatologists, the transplant coordinators, the financial coordinators, social workers, dietitians, and other people that are part of our liver team. We discuss your consultations and your interviews and determine what your next steps are. Very, very few people are ready right then to be listed for transplant. There's things they need to do, like social support, making sure that you have somebody that can help you get to and from the hospital, help you take care of yourself both before and after transplant. Some people have to lose weight, some people have to gain weight, some people have to develop a financial plan, and that information will come from the social worker. You may also have to do substance abuse relapse prevention counseling, and then we also obtain insurance authorization to list you once you're ready to list. Some people, though, may not be a candidate. They may have too many medical complications. They may have active alcohol and substance abuse issues. They may not have the support. It's unfortunate, but every once in a while we have someone who just doesn't have the support that's necessary for a successful transplant. Candidates will receive a telephone call and then that will be followed by a letter that tells you exactly what the plan is for you to move forward or in the event that you're not a candidate, it will tell you exactly why you're not a candidate. 
As you've seen, the transplant team has a lot of responsibilities in getting you prepared for transplant. However, the transplant candidate has their own set of responsibilities. Attending or viewing the additional liver education classes, it's extremely important to be very well informed about the transplant process, and it makes it a lot easier to get through. Women will also need mammograms and pap tests and provide us with the results. All candidates need dental clearance and oral cancer screening, and anyone over 50 or with a family history of colon cancer will need to provide us an up-to-date colonoscopy report. Up-to-date simply means if your last colonoscopy said repeat in 10 years that your colonoscopy is less than 10 years old. If it says repeat in five years that your colonoscopy is less than five years old. In most cases, you will only have 120 days to fulfill all these recommendations. If we can provide assistance with them, please let us know. Okay, we've gotten everything done that the transplant team needs to get done for your evaluation, and you've completed all of your requirements, so you're ready to list. Once you're on the list, what's important? First, learn as much as you can about transplant and liver disease. You're going to keep your liver clinic appointments and keep in touch with your coordinator about your labs for your MELD score updates. Most important, this is a long draining process in most cases, and you're going to maximize your mental and physical well-being. You're going to keep the things around you that make you happy. If it's playing golf, get out there and swing a club once in a while. If it's going fishing, sit at the end of the pier with a fishing rod in your hand. If it's your grandkids, find a way to keep those things that make you smile in your life. And second most important is your physical well-being. I strongly encourage each of you to add 30 minutes of activity to your day doesn't have to be fast, doesn't have to be a lot, it just needs to keep you moving for an additional 30 minutes. And last, you're going to maintain your relationships with your primary care physician and your gastroenterologist because what you will find is as you get sicker and sicker, we draw you closer and closer to us. Once you get transplanted, we start the process of pushing you away. And by the end of a year, we're only seeing you once a year and the only thing that we're managing are your anti-rejection drugs. You've been listed for liver transplant. It may have been a very long time, and now comes the most exciting call, the one you've been waiting for. The on-call coordinator calls you and says, we have an offer for you. She's going to give you very specific instructions. She's going to tell you to take your medicines as scheduled, except for your insulin, and you're going to follow her directions specifically because she will be the one that knows where you need to go when you get to the hospital, what door you need to come in, and where you need to be admitted. It's extremely important that you understand these instructions, so if you're too excited and can't process it all, give the phone to your caregiver so that the coordinator can explain it to them. Your on-call coordinator will also tell you exactly how quickly you need to be here. It's only in the movies and on television that you need to take an ambulance or a helicopter or an airplane to come and get a liver transplant. We've had patients that we've brought from Colorado, from California, from New Mexico, all to get a transplant and they got here in plenty of time. Reasons an offer may not work out are many. When we call you with your offer, there's a lot of things we know about that donor. We know their age, we know their height, their weight, their sex, we know what their cause of death is. We have an extensive social history and an extensive medical history in most cases. We also know that they're not HIV positive, we know what their hepatitis C status is, and we know what their hepatitis B status is. What we don't know is what that liver looks like. And sometimes when the recovery surgeon actually sees the liver in the operating room, it's either fatty or it can be the wrong size. In Georgia, most of the time it's fatty and fat livers just don't transplant well. Other reasons that are much less common, the donor family may occasionally rescind their consent for donation and obviously we have to honor that. And the last reason is that we may find that the donor has a cancer that nobody knew about, say a small kidney cancer. And in in that case, we can't use any of those organs. The transplant surgery itself will last four to six hours. 
This is typical as is a one to four day ICU stay and a seven to 14 day stay in the hospital. Remember when I said it was extremely important to stay as healthy as possible and to be as mobile as possible? This is where that really comes into play. You'll be able to rehabilitate from the surgery much more readily by having stayed healthy and mobile. You're ready to go home. The most important thing in being ready to go home is knowing your medications. Your medications are going to change from before transplant to after transplant. It's important that you know the name of your medication, the dose, the schedule, and the side effects. You will spend a lot of time with your nurses and transplant pharmacists learning how to manage your medications before you go home. This is what a typical medication schedule looks like after transplant. You may take additional drugs or may not take some drugs that are on this page. Home at last, you've been looking forward to this day. You're gonna take your medications as directed, you're gonna measure your blood pressure and your temperature and your weight every day and you're gonna keep it in your journal that you'll get at discharge. One thing you are not going to do is lift anything greater than five pounds. Most grocery bags weigh more than five pounds. Most grandchildren, kittens, and dogs weigh more than five pounds. This is extremely important as these incisions are very, very large and are very prone to hernias, and early lifting of heavy weights is the primary cause of hernias. You'll also call your post coordinator with any questions that you might have after discharge. The lab draw schedule after discharge is twice a week for the first month, and these must be drawn at Piedmont Atlanta Hospital so that we can get your anti-rejection drug levels back the same day. Then they'll be done once a week for months two and three, every other week for months four, five, and six, and then once a month for the rest of your life. You may be asked to have labs more often based on your condition or on previous lab results. Your clinic visit schedule after discharge is the first week on Tuesday, the second week on Tuesday, the third week you come in just to have your staples removed. Then you come in at four weeks and six weeks, both on Tuesdays. At your 12-week mark, your schedule changes to either a Monday or Thursday. You come in at 12 weeks, then six months, and then annually, all on Monday or Thursday. You may have more frequent visits based on your condition and based on labs. Prior to your annual appointment, you'll be contacted to schedule your annual procedures. Those will include a chest x-ray, bone density scan, liver ultrasound, you may have a liver biopsy, and you may have an MRI. You'll be asked to have procedures more often again based on lab work and your condition. Candidates have the option to be listed at multiple transplant centers. It is important to remember that each transplant center is its own entity and makes decisions based on their evaluation of your candidacy for transplant. Candidates also may transfer from one transplant center to another. This is far more important for kidney patients who spend long time on waiting lists and if they move they want to be able to transfer that waiting time. You will be provided with a booklet and a signature page that states you've received this information. Piedmont Transplant Institute participates in research studies. Research studies evaluate medications, vaccines, or new ways of using known treatments. If your case meets the criteria for one of our research studies, you'll be approached by a research coordinator to explain your options. Agreeing to or declining to participate in a research study in no way affects the care that is provided. It's purely a voluntary decision. As a volunteer in a research study, you may have the opportunity to participate in the development of new therapies that will benefit future patients. The availability of the transplant team includes a transplant surgeon, hepatologist, transplant coordinator that are available 24 hours per day, seven days per week, and 365 days per year to provide transplant program coverage. Other services are available as needed for the care of the transplant patients. You have the choice not to undergo transplantation. If you choose not to have a transplant, treatment for your liver disease will continue. If you do not undergo the transplant surgery, your condition is likely to worsen and limit your life expectancy. If you have indicated that you want a liver and are active on the waiting list, but decide you do not want a liver when offered, you will be removed from the list unless there are obvious medical contraindications at the time of offer. 
Here are some reliable websites that we encourage you to visit to learn more about liver transplant and liver disease. There is a page in your liver education folder titled Contact Numbers. It has the liver transplant team's contact information, especially your transplant coordinators, both pre and post, and your social workers, as well as the main number and instructions as to when you can call after hours and on the weekends and holidays. The liver transplant process can be very challenging, but also very exciting. We live the Piedmont Promise at Piedmont Transplant Institute and look forward to taking very good care of you.